we're delighted to have Jim Herlihy there and you're all very welcome. Um, this, the meeting is going to be recorded. So if you want to listen to it later on, you can through the YouTube, um, the YouTube channel, the Claire Root Society YouTube channel, uh, which is available on the website, um, the Claire Roots website. Anyway, we're delighted this evening to welcome Jim Herlihy. And Jim Herlihy is the foremost authority on um, the police force here in Ireland um, and is the, the go-to person for any, any research, as far as I'm concerned, with the Irish police. Um, Jim is the author of a number of books, and I'm just going to rattle them off very quickly for you. Uh, the, the index, the Royal Irish Constabulary uh, Service Records Index, it's, that's the red book, 1816 to 1922, and I think that was the first book that he wrote. Uh, he has two books on the Dublin Metropolitan Police Force. He has a book on the Royal Irish Constabulary Officers, uh, the Irish Revenue Police, and his most recent book is The Black and Tans, 1920 to 1921. So Jim is going to talk to us this evening about tracing your Irish police ancestors. And um, he was telling me there's always new information that comes up with his research. So um, we're delighted to have him here. He, he did speak, I believe, at a Claire Rue Society conference back in 2013. And um, so we're, we're thrilled to have him back. And um, a big um, round of applause, Zoom applause to Jim. On, um, on coming to speak to us. So we're going to mute everybody while his presentation takes place. Any questions, please um, put them into the chat box and we will deal with questions at the end of the presentation. And anybody who'd like to let us know where they are um, listening to um, or listening from this evening, please feel free to put that in the chat box. We are always interested to see where people are listening from. Not everybody is within Ireland on Zoom. People are in other parts of the world. And it's always kind of nice to know that we have a, a large audience. So I'm going to hand over to Jim. And uh, Jim is sharing his screen. And off you go, Jim. Many thanks. Uh, th thank you, Jane, for your introduction. And oh, you're welcome. Also, also for inviting me to speak to, I can't believe it's eight years, so it's nine years now almost uh, since was at the, the last meeting. Um, what I'm going to try to do is, uh, by way of introduction, I want to explain where I'm coming from. My, my earliest introduction to police as such, uh, I spent 36 years in the Garda Shea Corner, retired in 2013. And the route that I've taken to find records and then translate what I've found uh, into publications. Uh, so the people could follow the same route, with hopefully with results. And then no sooner have your book finished when some new information comes along and I've been gathering. So far I've collected, I've been in contact with relatives over probably 35 years and I have 21,000 photographs collected. I've also a relational database in that every record that I've had to put on the system, uh, I've also a link to the person who supplied the information. The police forces, we'll be talking about this. There's several other police forces in Ireland that I've, I've encountered along the way. Um, you have the Constabulary of Ireland, there's the Revenue Police there in the centre, uh, the Dublin Metropolitan Police, and then the Civic Guards of the Garda Shea Corner, who's celebrating their centenary this year. Uh, you have the Harbour Police, uh, the Dublin Harbour Police, the Belfast Harbour Police, and of course you have the Royal Ulster Constabulary, also, uh, commemorating their centenary, which occurred on the 1st of June, 1922. Then Little Harbour Police there in Sligo, and CIE had its own little police force from 1945 to 64. And uh, 100 years ago also, um, between the change of the Garda Shea Corner and from the RIC, there was still, what we know, term criminality at the time. So there was uh, a little police force set up um, you can see it there, the, the last badge on the right hand side, from the investigation department, based in Oriel House, dealing with serious crime. This is my first introduction to police was um, Christmas 1958, I visited Santa Claus, and I grabbed my parcel and I ran out the door and I got lost uh, in Park City. I went up the wrong street, and over the wrong bridge and up to the north side, and I was in custody inside in the station, so it would have looked something like this at the time, a Shandon station. 
and that's what I would have looked at one wearing a dress at the time, by the way. Um, now, just I get my uh, and he made uniforms for the Royal Irish Constabulary. Uh, that's me taken in 1959, age five. And as a seven-year-old, he brought me to an old RAC station where he helped the RAC escape out in 1920. Uh, he emigrated to, he was born in 1879 and emigrated to Boston in 1898. And this is him in Boston in 1910. He returned in 1915, joined the British Army, survived the Battle of the Somme, and I have a trunk full of information, his medals and discharge papers. And I even got a photograph from the Cork Examiner. And you can see the cap edge he's wearing in the photograph. I have that at home also. I have his discharge papers. I followed him up uh, through the war and I've actually got uh, a letter he even sent. Uh, he had been in Belita back to a uh, hospital in England and I got his medical records only recently. Um, this is one of the last uniforms that he would have made um, and believe it or not, it's actually made in 1924 when uh, this policeman uh, who was stationed in Carrigadrough had, had actually emigrated to England following disbandment. And he had, he had sent home the material for a uniform to be made up so that he could wear one last time. Um, the station, as I said, was attacked in 1920. And the story, just the story I had at the time was, uh, one of the headlines was the fiddlers that beach in Fane. And, the RAC knowing that they were going to get out of the station, some guys started playing the fiddle inside, but I think there was a bit of poetic license used. In fact, I got a photograph and they're playing it after the event. Um, I was stationed in Blarney for nearly 30 years. And when I arrived at the station, I discovered that that station also had been attacked in 1920. So I tried to find out what happened. And I was lucky enough to track down the daughter of the last sergeant. I brought her back to the station, walked her through a bit. This is a photograph she gave me of her father who defended the station at the time. And as a result of that interview, I got to work on the Michael Collins film and the window shakes the barley because she gave me, in walking her through the station, I got a description of all of the rooms that they would appear in 1920. And that's what's used in both films. And this is the man who had led the attack on the station. And strangely enough, he's buried within probably not even five meters from. Uh, Sergeant Larkin. And he arrived back to the station. This guy had shot several people during the War of Independence, but in 1965, he arrived back into the station and he told us that the clock was stolen in 1920. And one of the detectives met him the following day and he brought back the clock. Um, I was uh, looking for information then, trying to find out who was in both stations in 1920. It took me so long to find out, but this is a person I met. This lady rang me one day and she says, I have a live one for you. And I said, what do you mean? She said, my father's still alive. He was in the Royal Irish Constabulary. So I went up to Dublin. And I've learned more from that man um, as a witness to everything that happened. And I literally ran out of the tape talking to him. Uh, he was ended up 74 years of pensioner. He died in 1996. Uh, as a result of it then, I came to write and compiled uh, one book on all. First of all, it was dedicated to uh, that constable, but I gathered up as many records as I could, mostly those who were killed on duty, short history and genealogical guide, and the records that I'd encountered up to that time. But in the book, there was um, about 2,000 people that would have got made and say, went off to the First World War, volunteered. Uh, and then, as a result, of, I kept on getting more and more information. So. The book was revised in 2016, and I've added several other lists to that, for example, all of those who got further medals, those who served in the Crimea um, and volunteered for service, and uh, what other newer records and sources that came available since. Then I discovered that most of the regular RAC men were recommended by officers. And from 1816, even though this book begins, say, in 1816, or the index begins in 1816, up to 1922. But the Irish Constabulary didn't become a, a national police force until 1836. And why I say it's 1816 is when the four provincial police forces were amalgamated, they said, who have we now? So what they did was they got the four inspectors general of the four different police forces. 
and they asked them, who's the most senior person in your organization that's now being amalgamated? So the earliest record went back to a person who joined in 1816. So that's where the records go back to 1816. They were still serving. It does not cover people who either resigned, died, or were killed before 1836. It begins in that, but the earliest one uh, begins in 1816. And there's um, 85,000 uh, records, 83 and a half thousand in that plus the 1,700 officers. And these are the, the officers then, the 1,700, the biographical dictionary of one of those. In that book, there's 240 photographs. I now have in excess of 1,300 photographs as a result of descendants of those making contact with me. Um, and every day I get something new in it. Um, one of the officers I was investigating at the time for the book was um, Tobias O'Sullivan. And I've, only, I've recently discovered in the last few years that he ends up being uh, my aunt who emigrated to Boston, married his first cousin in Boston. I didn't know that at the time, uh, but you can see there I put a rose on it at the time and I found it and I used grass to try and get the information off. And they came back a year later and someone had cleaned it up. Now, what's interesting about it is that he was shot dead in the stall and uh, one of his sons, um, that's in there, Tobias O'Sullivan. There's two sons uh, and the other two policemen, that's his wife who died shortly afterwards. And also his uh, two other relatives who were also the six policemen in that family and the 16 in their family tree. Now his daughter, or his son, married the stand-in for Maureen O'Hara in the quiet man, Etta Bohan. And sadly, she was knocked down by a car in Cornamona in Galway uh, in 2002. Now, another coincidence that came up was Maureen O'Hara herself. Uh, I discovered that a cousin of mine who was doing the family tree in Dublin actually, actually owns the house where she was born. And I got to stay there. and. About three years later, I was on duty in Blarney Garden Station, and this lady came in, and she was just spitting him to Martin O'Hara. And I, I, I said, you look like, like her, and she said, I'm actually your sister, we're looking for directions. So I said, i tell you what we'll do is, I'll pretend that you're Martin O'Hara, we'll totally ignore your sister. And so I found the blue light, escorted him to this house anyway, and um, she got out, and I said, you don't know me. And she said, why? I said, I slept in your bed, and she got a great Anybody interested in um, the conflict on both sides, I would definitely recommend. It's actually about his killing, um, but it's an extraordinary book on both sides defense. Anyone would have to be moved by this, an extraordinary account, independent account. No. Oh, sorry. Um, just as regards officers, uh, what information you can get on officers, you have the surname and Christian name, the date that they were appointed, the age they were appointed, their native county, their religion, if they were married, the date of marriage in the wife's native county, the dates they were appointed to various districts, they had previous service in the army, and conclusion then whether they were uh, disbanded, whether they retired, or that. Now, I discovered then that I got so much correspondence as a result of doing the work on the RIC that still people were making contact with me saying, I have a death certificate, he's a policeman. And outside of, um, in Dublin, Dublin had its own police force from uh, 1836, actually goes back to 1786 with Dublin police, but from 1836, 12,556 men joined the Dublin Metropolitan Police. So I found, uh, this this register in the Garda Museum, it had actually been taken out of the skip uh, in Dublin Castle. And this is uh, these are what the entries are like. Now this has since since my book came out, the book the original rec register has been digitised and it's available on the US UCD website. But another thing I found also was an index which everybody up to that period thought was. Um, exact and everything. But what I found was when I went to literally strip down the numbers and match the name of the record, there's probably about 200 missing. Any awkward name that he couldn't translate or compile the index, just left it out, especially with maximum names like that. And I did a book then explaining what the Dublin Metropolitan Police was about. And 
he had a different, completely different rank structure from constable, detective constable, and they're in various divisions in Dublin, in Dublin City. They were amalgamated, they continued after 1922, and they were amalgamated with the Garda in 1925, and they became the Dublin Metropolitan Division of the Garda Shikana. Now, I got rid of the myth straight away that every DMP man was over six foot, that the records speak for themselves. And, but they had, they had it done very cleverly in the divisions that were in the centre of the city. They had the tallest men there. In other words, if you arrived up by train, you'd meet all these six footers all in around the city and you pres would presume that all the others were over six feet. They were just strategically placed uh, out of Kevin Street. Then I discovered when I was going through the RIC records, I came across dual entries of admission in the Irish Constabulary from the 1st of October, um, uh, 1857. And I discovered that who were these people because even though the date of entry was the 1st of October onwards, there was also another date preceding that, and I discovered they were actually revenue police. Now, you have two and a half thousand policemen chasing Cochin makers, and they had actually two ships to go up and down the western seaboard, uh, literally to chase them and take them out to the islands. And I, this is the link with the RIC. 498 ex-members of the Irish Revenue Police were given a month's pay for each year of service and next month's pay for lost employment. 598 of the Irish Revenue Police enlisted in the constabulary on the 1st of October 1857. And another 28 of the Revenue Police became officers in the constabulary. And 48 went across the Dublin Metropolitan Police. Some went to London Derry Police. So there's a link again. And they're the same people that were in both organisations. So you have more information on them. Um, and with the Irish Revenue Police, you had to be 25 to join, five foot seven in height. Uh, privates were not permitted to marry. If you got married, you got sacked. It's that simple. With an exemplary character. And um, he's only given a character reference, for example, for another position if he resigns. He had to at least two and a half year service. Um, I found that a lot of emigrants that would have joined stayed for about two years gathered up the funds and used that funds then to emigrate because they, were, they had good pay for the time they was in it, but it was very hard work. Now, the police don't have trust in the UK. Uh, remember every policeman in the United Kingdom up to the present day. However, they also include and remember all the police in Ireland up to uh, partition in 1922. And I was able to add them to this book, their, to their memorial book, and they're remembered every year in, by them. Um, now, 642 policemen lost their lives. You probably read all about the promotion about looking for memorial, but this one amounts to 642 policemen killed in the line of duty between 1836 and 1922. And this one memorial would look like I was ready, I everybody's name ready to go on it. Um, and you can see the hassle there is about at the moment. But on top of that, also, 752 RA seamen joined the British Army, volunteered for service in World War I, and 178 lost their lives. And they served in all these regiments. I found every single one of their graves matched with the World Race Commission. A third of them were, tons, were sons of RA seamen. And finally, I just, as I, the last book, the most recent book is The Black and Tans, and I just explained briefly what they're about. Um, and, and Christmas of 1920, this is what the police force in Ireland, the RIC, would be made up of. Um, you'd have the regular RIC man. You'd have an RIC man uh, who would have had medals for having uh, served in World War I and volunteered. You'd, you'd have what they call the black and tan because they had short and un, a shortage of uniforms. And that's the reason they were bring, brought in a short notice. You'd the auxiliary division. Uh, the, the one they were wearing that crossbow with the ammunition on it. And then you had the Veterans and Drivers Division. These were not really active men at all. They were brought in just as mechanics, um, mostly guys near retirement, um, just to do the fatigue side uh, in their camps. Now, this idea that they were all left out of prison does not exist whatsoever. Um, in fact, the records that have survived, the few records that have survived, showed the extent that they went into to look at their background. 
This is a farm tree, a place to every Irish human also a place to black and tan, just a farm they would have completed. And if they had any scars or that type of thing was just mapped on, you can see on the system there, just as a summary account. There's also a medical surgery completed on the same farm. And there's an attestation with this four and north also on the same farm. This is number 80135 William Turner. Um, now, just explain briefly the, the different types of ones that were there. You the RIC Special Reserve. What happened was uh, from the 1st of January 1920, the RIC Inspector General said that he couldn't cope uh, under the present situation. So there was a recruiting campaign in England and they recruited 7,684 7, members of the, of the RIC Special Reserve. Now, these are men who supplemented the RIC men and replaced the RIC men. They were retiring, resigning, being killed on duty. And they went to a particular station. They were the short of uniforms. That's why they have this black and tan uniform. But they, they built up the station numbers. And 381 of them were Irish. Then in September, um, they brought in the temporary constable. There was no temporary constable in the RIC before uh, September. And they opened Gormiston camp because they had recruited um, Churchill Dallas Way in going after the IRA, and he did that with what they call the Auxiliary Division, temporary cadets. They were for the difference between the Auxiliary Division and the Black and Tans is that the Auxiliaries were former army officers, and whereas the others were non-commissioned officers. Um, and then, of course, they needed uh, transport. So the Open Gormiston camp, the temporary constables were the ones that with, went uh, with them I used the transport, the drivers, the, the fatigues. And then you have, uh, they had defensive barrack sergeants. What they are, they're in modern day terms, they're health and safety men. They're the guys who went ahead of them, uh, went to the various stations and did a survey of the station and both of the station. They had five casualties. Uh, probably the most famous back in time is William Hill, the bookmaker. That's how he started off his business from his, the compensation he got as a black and tan. He was injured down in Middleton, uh, injured in both legs, and he applied for a compensation in Ireland. Um, just a brief history of policing in Ireland. Um, first of all, you have the Baronia Constabulary, go back to 1787, 1822. Very little records survive of those in, in patches, unless somebody, there's, again, if, it, if you've gone to trouble, the best, the best policemen to find and the easiest ones to find are the ones who've gone to trouble, are the ones who. Uh, unless something to do with finance, you'd always find great records uh, to the British kept great records in relation to finance. Uh, they continued up to 1822. Then you have the Peace Preservation Force. They were stopped in 1814. And what they did was they were a task force. They had uh, huge difficulties down in the barony of Middleturd in County Tipperary. So they got a chief magistrate to go down and they brought 20 cavalry sergeants and they literally cleaned, cleaned out the place at the time, but the difficulty was they had no local knowledge. A lot of innocent people got caught up in the affray. So one thing, since they had no local knowledge, what they had to do was organize police forces in the various counties. So then they set up in 1822, what they called the County Constabulary, with four different provincial headquarters, four different types of uniform, four different types of training. So then they, discovered, they decided in 1836, it formed one national police force called the Irish Constabulary. And they put this constabulary black uh, plaque up on usually a whitewashed station in the middle of the village, a big house. And that became from then on one of the 1600 stations that they would eventually hold. And then in 1867, for suppressing the Fenian Rising, they were um, granted the title Royal. And then it comes to become the Royal Irish Constabulary. Uh, just other police forces that were there, you had the Dublin Police from 1786 to 1836, from the Dublin Metropolitan Police up to 1925, just the um, Revenue Police up to 1857, with the Belfast Police and the Derry City Police, and they were both subsumed into the Royal Irish Constabulary. Um, the Belfast Police in 1865, and you had the Derry City Police in 1870. Um, then you had other police forces, Harbour Police, Irish Railway Police, uh, you're the Oriel House Detectives, 1922 to 23, 
Um, the Cork City Police were set up by the business interests in Cork because the irregulars were holding Cork City at the time. And when Michael Collins was killed, his funeral was not policed either by the RHC or the Garda Sheikhan, it was policed by the Cork Civic Patrol. And in fact, I have a very interesting letter. Um, in 1923, the man who was in charge of them subsequently became a chief superintendent of the guards. And he put in a claim, he hired a car on the day from Johnston Paris garage, I think it was one pound and 10 shillings, to superintend his men along the road, and the bill had not been paid a year later, so he put in the claim for it, and I got a copy of that claim recently. Then you have the Royal Oster Constabulary formed on the 1st of June, 1922, uh, and they became the police service of Northern Ireland in 2001. Um, looking at the Peace Preservation Force, um, this is the Chief Magistrate uh, there on your, that was sent down to, uh, so Richard Wilcox was his name. He had been a Dublin Police Magistrate. Um, and this is what uh, the Peace Preservation Force uh, uh, Cavalry Sergeant would have looked like at the time. He'd have worn the cloak. And that, the significance of that cloak is nearly brought up to the present day with continuing on to the RAC and the RUC in that with the Cavalry Sergeant, they, the RAC Sergeant had his stripes um, on his lower sleeve. And with the cloak, when you put back the cloak, the distributor stripes and just the way the cavalry would have gone there also. Um, now, I came across uh, one of the biggest losses, other than what was lost in the four courts, I think lost to police was um, there was a Patrick Carroll who, there were two Patrick Carrolls in the Garda Sheep Corner. And in fact, they had nicknames on both of them. One was called Pinhead and the other was called Puddinhead. Well, Pinhead anyway, Puddinhead becomes commissioner but Pinhead becomes um, deputy commissioner. And he spent practically all his, every evening and practically most days in the state paper office, which was the record town Dublin Castle. And then all the, everything was transferred to the National Archives. But I've come across uh, his notebooks and it took me years to unravel them, but he uh, collected everything, put them all into various categories. And I have 500 pages typed up on the various headings that I put into some extraordinary material in it, um, which is completely lost. But the sad part about it was his books were so detailed that not alone did he make a record of um, the floor that he was on where the, where the records he was looking at, the shelf that it was on, and the box that it was in. And if anybody's familiar with the record from which the old Garden Museum, it's a circular building. All they had to do was, when they were transferring the records that they had known about these, they could have transferred them ordinarily to the National Archives. Never happened, massive loss. However, his notebooks, not have written in pencil, um, but absolute gems in it, especially Peace Preservation Force. Um, now, and then, of course, the County Constabulary, you can see some of the uniforms that were there, and they said there was a um, National Police Force, or it becomes the National Police Force, but to the four different training depots. Um, and there are the types of uniforms. They wore white duck trousers in, in the summer. Um, now, people looking for records before, I'm off last this question, before 1836, where are they going to find them? Parliamentary returns for various reasons. For example, uh, this, is, this one here shows between 1822 and 1830, persons killed by members of the county constabulary in the phrase. And sometimes it mentions the, the policeman concerned uh, and as a result of that killing. Persons wounded, uh, again. And then you have constabulary who were killed or wounded, again, so, uh, in a phrase. Some great details of information. If you had an answer to you know he was in a particular case, you might pick them up on that. Now, this is a very interesting one in that 1832 shows superannuations awarded to 175 members of the county constabulary. And you can see how much they were awarded and the, and the reason that they would have been injured at the time to, to get a pension. Uh, uh, in order to understand the RIC afterwards, you have to understand the uh, rank structure. Before 1882, you joined as a sub-constable, second class. If you kept your mouth shut and your head down for a year and had a clean record, you, you progressed to the first class. You were given a certificate. 
and you could not go for promotion unless you produced that certificate. Um, then you became an acting constable, next rank is constable. Then you had a, a head constable, third and fourth class. The fourth class, or sorry, first and second class. The second class one had three stripes. The head constable, the first class had four stripes. Then the officer structure then was sub-inspector, county inspector, assistant inspector general, deputy inspector general, and then inspector general. However, after October 1882, you joined as a constable, you went to the depot as a recruit, but you joined as a constable. So a sub-constable becomes a constable, an acting constable becomes an acting sergeant. Uh, a constable becomes a sergeant. A head constable, there's only one. They were all based at district headquarters station. You never find them in the small station. The sub-inspector becomes a district inspector and the other ranks, top ranks remain the same. Um, a person might come across some rank similar to this, um, and these are ones I've only found in the depot. For example, the head constable major, he was the most se senior non-commissioned officer, only based at headquarters, and there was only 18 of them in its entirety. There were a total of five bandmasters the whole way through. You had a hospital constable, bugle major, farriers, of course, for the mounted troop, and the depot surgeon was based there. Um, now, the instructions all had, every recruit had to fill out something like this. Uh, there's something like over a thousand, what they say, um, records in the code to explain about what, what the code was, code of instruction. The code was for internal regulations, for the guide to the act of parliament was the other one that was studied. But they literally had to write down every one and learn it off. And this is one that survived from February 1845. Now, I come to the service records. What has survived are not the complete uh, service records, people often get confused with it. What has survived is what we call the register of service. And the register of service is only a summary. The main file, and I'll show you one shortly, you know, what would have been on the file and what's completely lost. There's only samples of those kept in the public records office in two about six files. And it's a shame what's, what's gone. But the numbers begin with, uh, the good thing about finding an ancestor in the RHC is that once you find them, you can pin everything to his number afterwards. Um, and it makes it very easy. For example, the 834 Murphys in the RAC, they all had a unique sequential number. So the registered number, his name and Christian name, uh, the age he was appointed. It'd be 19th of join, but if your father was in it, you got a year off the age. It'd be five foot nine to join, but if your father was in it, you got an inch off the height. Now, I learned that from this guy, Kerrigan, the RAC man that I interviewed. Because he said, I know, he says, I, I squeezed in on the both counts. Um, you, you could, uh, your native county is given. Uh, sometimes there are two native counties given. Number one, if there are two on the service record, it means that the second county, one is where you were born, and the other one is where you would have been listed from. Uh, you could be working away by the time you joined the RSC. Religion, if there's a change of religion, there's the line driven through and the date of the new religion taken up. If you're married, you have to seven years service before you're permitted to marry. Uh, the wife was vetted, they don't say what vetting is, but you couldn't um, you couldn't be stationed in your wife's county or your your own county. Or if you had other relatives um, stationed in another county, you couldn't be stationed there either. There must be some bond that for that. Um, now, then if you were, for, in order to join, you had to be recommended by a magistrate. The vast majority were recommended also by officers in the constabulary. Uh, you are a justice of the peace who, who had to be personally known to you. Your previous occupation or trade of calling is in it. The date you were appointed is there. For example, you, you went to join one particular date, you failed a medical, they give you a chance to come back a year. You'd lose your service in between and that would be stated on the record. The other reappointments would be those who uh, joined, volunteered for service in World War One, came back, and they would get the benefit. And it would, on the record, it would say, benefit of previous service in the Royal Irish Constabulary and the Army, and would say five years down to days, and there would be there you know, for pension purposes. Uh, the county's of allocation, the date you were promoted, uh, all the way up to various ranks, that date is given. If you've got any rewards, fines, or punishments, they're on it. If you've got any unfavorable records, they were taken note of, especially an awful in relation to drink and the fine went up. 
and finding more warrant that you'll see on some of the record that's warrant towards dismissal you're know, heading on the slippery slope the date you were discharged dismissed pension went on pension that's also if you're an injury the date of the injury is written on it and then if you died in the service the cause of the injury is written on it and another interesting thing about that those entitled the pensions uh, up to uh, 1919 are only the only Irish seamen who got pensions were those um, of widows' pensions. The only ones who got widows' pensions were, uh, were the widows of men who were killed in the line of duty. So they had a widows and orphan fund that they set up, and the not only the widow get um, a gratuity, but the unmarried sons and daughters would also get a gratuity. All those records are in find my past for each of. Uh, of the RFC. There's a remarks column then at the very end of it. And CO and TD in a connected, people think continued or this type of thing is not. Well, it is, uh, it's the county in which you were connected uh, at the time. In other words, in other words, the, it was the place you were not going to be transferred to by having relatives in that particular place. Um, now, this is not a parliamentary return that I found very useful in that where you find an RFC man is recommended by a justice of the peace. This is completely suggested peace for the country in 1882. And um, when a person, if you say they didn't get a birth record or this type of thing, this, this is where the person, that uh, peace commissioner had to be personally known, or the, the RSC to be personally known when he enlisted. And this is a great record to see where that person was living at the time. Um, just as regards looking into stations, this was Carrigan Dodd Station, as I said earlier on, where my father helped the RSC escape over in 1920. Uh, and this is the other station where I would have been in the guard for the best part of 30 years. That's them both 1900 and 1910. Both attacked the same week in 1920, and that's, that was the result. Um, now, anybody, this is one of the best things you can ever look up in the RSC. It's called the Royal Irish Constabulary List and Directory. Uh, there's a written version about 1836, but it shows the packing order of the RAC. It shows every person above the rank of uh, constable, the, uh, where they are in, in various countries. Complete list of RAC stations, the 1600 station, who's in charge of the station, what district it's in. And it was published on the 1st of July, 1841, up to the 1st of July, 1921. Uh, it, was, it was founded originally by uh, John Monser, he was a clerk in headquarters, and he continued until he retired in 1873. That man knew everybody who was in the constabulary all that period. In fact, his son continued after, became an officer uh, afterwards, but it's a fantastic record. And again, they've been digitized around by my past. Uh, now, anybody want to research a particular RAC station, this is um, a very good starting point. This particular book, I know I've seen it online. Um, somebody has um, made it free online and not one stage. Uh, but it's a road and route guide. Of every, this man was absolutely meticulous. He sent around um, a circular to every every uh, district headquarters for them and every station to compile a list in of every station and, and an awful lot more information to go with it and put it on to book farm and also to the map. And this is just the entry for Blarney alone. Uh, Blarney is a village, this is published in 1893. Um, 800 people are living there. It's in the Barney Beast Muskery, it's in Mid Cox Civil Division, it's in Munster, just a telephone number. The Petty Sessions are held there. Um, the Cock and Muskery Town services the area, the railway services the area. The time the post arrives in the morning and goes in the evening. Uh, when you can get a postal order, uh, saving, there's savings bank or money order in the local post office. Um, the nearest physical feature uh, and the sergeant in charge at the time. But more importantly, all the other stations in proximity to it. Uh, for example, Banner Bridge Station is four miles. And what it is, if you stood at the door of Blarney Station and you walk three quarters of a mile, you turn left, walked another mile, all the way over, you'll eventually arrive at Banner Bridge Station. Now, if you think that's good, when he was in Belfast, he even said whether the streets were town academy or not. Uh, sadly, the man committed suicide. Um, I found his grave. He's actually buried in Mount Jerome Cemetery. 
Now, this is a book I'm working on at the moment, and thanks to the pandemic, I've been able to literally type up all the service record. Now, these are not loan stations. These are the temporary huts during the land wars um, that were uh, sent to uh, dangerous areas at, at the time during them between 1881 and 1883. 440 members of the Royal Irish Constabulary Auxiliary Force were brought in. Um, and you can see that guy that's in there, he has a white epaulette. They were known as the magpies because looking at them in the distance in the strangest of places in the country, look, look like the magpies coming out of the ditches. They relieved the regular RAC. They're mostly, it's like the real forerunners of the Black and Tans, but they didn't take part. All they did was, if there was um, an outrage, for example, a landlord was intimidated, and it happened again and again, they decided to put drop one of these huts. It was like an Ikea hut that was, came down by train, uh, put together, you can see the numbers and the kits that were, uh, that were used uh, to do it. Furniture came with it. The stove, they stayed in it until uh, the matter was dealt with. Uh, I, I tracked every single one of them at this January. Uh, there's 440. Um, and only about a dozen of them joined the RAC afterwards. And of the, of the dozen, it's about eight, I think, died kind of prematurely because they'd been out in all sorts of weather and wettings and TB and they got afterwards. Now, when this is the type of information that lost, there would have been on a, on a service record at the time that, for example, let's produce a birth chart. This is an example I have of I'm one of the few files that exist in Q in the Public Records Office. And this is Alexander Tissel. No, this is his birth certificate. And I just put in his parents' marriage certificate to show who he was. And he's born above in County Cabin. Now, when he presents him at the station, uh, you can see his application to join the RAC. The photographs I put at the side are actual photographs of those who signed it. Like, as I said, most of the officers got at this stage. Uh, please have this candidate attested and sent to the depot in the usual way if found fit. This would have been on everybody's record before he was sent off. The candidate may attend here, the district inspector here says it, and then please comply with my minutes, uh, comply with a big report that the candidate will attend as directed. And that's what Roland there, the man at the very end is saying, he's been sent off. And then uh, you can see he's um, a big to report the candidate for, oh yeah, as I mentioned before, if your father was in, you got a year off the age of an inch at the height, he was bordering on the uh, 19, wasn't quite 19 at the time. So they asked the question, the giant chance we can squeeze him in quick uh, because his father was in it, they could drop down the edge to facilitate him. Um, then this is the form he actually completed at the time. Uh, and this applies to every RSM and down through the years, the question around. Then there's a medical search. When he's sent up to the depot, there's an, uh, the, first of all, he attends a doctor in the uh, his own area. And, arrives with a certificate, it's double checked above. Then he, the oath is also written into the one form. And again, on the other side, if there's any scarf, that's written on it. That's the form filled up, every recruit near his city. Then he had to undergo an examination in arithmetic, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. And then he had to do some dictation. That's his original one. As I said, this applies to every RAC man. It's a shame that's what have been on the file. And then, it says here, red copy, I beg to state the candidate was attested, found fit, and directed to proceed here to the depot on this day, and afraid that if the candidate would be subjected to intimidation below to go back home, I direct him to head, head there straight away. This is 1921. I arrived in the depot, and that's what he would have faced in the depot, which is now Gary headquarters. Uh, and then his recruit training, he'd be measured up. Uh, he would have gone to classes like this. Then he would have done training. He, one of the things he had to possess was uh, a suit of clothes. Uh, this is the first day of class, fire drill. And I tracked him afterwards when he emigrated from Derry to New York in 1930. He joined the US Army in World War I, I'm sorry, World War II in 1942. And sadly, he was drowned on 23rd of April 1944 in the lake. Um, now, this is a type of photograph lot people who went in the RSC probably turn up for the first time. And the pillbox cap, that, that's before 1900, you can see this William Debry, just an example of the type of young person would have come across. Uh, he'd have got an ID card, that's what an ID card would have looked like at the time. 
with his registered number on it. This is him as a sergeant and his family. And then when he retired, he was given a parchment certificate of character. Uh, a lot of relatives have turned up with these, signed by the county inspector. He would have got that when it was blank. And he had to go to the local district inspector who was familiar to him, his last officer. And that would be filled out in his presence. That's where he gets the physical description. He'd also get another record telling him how much his pension would be. The seed would be applied to it and signed by the county inspector. And this was his pension record, which is on if I may pass on them. Um, and this is another ID that he got afterwards then when he went to uh, ended up in England. Now it's a very interesting thing about the medals, just there were three royal visits, 1900 Victoria, uh, Edward VII, 1903, and King George V in um, 1911. And that's both sides of the, of the medals, the lower medals ones and, and the lower one. Uh, Queen Victoria, um, actually what's on the front of it there, you see this, this second one from the left, is actually Hibernia welcoming Victoria and the ship. Uh, and the same, except the date is different in 1903. Now, on a lot of the uniforms, you'll identify uniforms after 1903 by the light ribbon you'll see over the left pocket. Uh, in 1911, then, these were all named with the rank and at the, they had the time, so they're easily traceable. Uh, to 1911, if you were on the route of King George V, um, you would have got the one to green, the dark green to red stripes medal. And the other one was a special medal, which Royal Irish Constabulary, which is quite a rare medal, I think only 500 votes were, were issued. These were those who, um, who had distinguished service uh, and it was the imprimatur of the king at the time to, for those who were recommended to him to get those medals. Uh, the top right hand corner are the Royal Victorian medals. They're still being given out by, by the Queen as a special token of the Queen on various visits. The South African medals, some of them would have gone to the South African War and they'd been wearing these medals. And some of the officers in the RAC would have worn the one the extreme left the, uh, the silver medal, Queen Victoria as well. Um, now, disbandment of the RAC, 180 only transferred to the Garda Sheikh Corner, 788 went to Palestine, and 1521. Um, transferred to the Royal Ulster Constabulary. I have those lists completely finished. I matched their service records with the Garda records, the Palestine Police, and the Royal Ulster Constabulary. Um, and I have the registered numbers that they would have done. So it's another avenue to follow. And I hope to do something on the aftermath of the RAC to see where they went after. Some people want to find out what happened. Um, as regards the Palestine Police, uh, Palestine Gendarmerie becomes the Palestine Police in 1925. Uh, it was made up of the RAC, these would be black and tans went out there, temporary constables went out, regular or old RAC, the auxiliary division, and the ones were not RAC, but the total that set it up at the time was 850, predominantly Irish, predominantly Royal Oster Constabulary, or Royal Irish Constabulary. And this is uh, just what the Sunday Independence saying this 100 years ago. And Royal Ulster Constabulary, then you can see 1,076 transferred over. I've seen some of the books from the 1st of June of 1922 in the IUC, and there's no difference, just the word Irish was line drawn through it and Ulster was put in. Um, and then this is the total, 1,521. And the Garrett Shikana, 335 um, constables are transferred over, 64 sergeants, two head constables only, district inspectors, eight. Now, this is one of the most interesting characters that have come out. He's the first registered guard, uh, PJ Kerrigan. And we're putting a plaque up to him on the 14th of March in Westport. Um, he was born in Westport in 1892, joined the RAC in 1913, left and volunteered for service in World War I, got injured and came back home. And then the first guard of Commissioner Michael Staines, um, was from Mayo, and he must have told him to get down to Dublin. He anyway. Actually, the person who, who intended being number one arrived a day early, and they weren't ready for him early the following day, and he becomes number one. And then he he got into trouble, uh, had to leave, and he was an instructor at the start, and there were conflicting ideas as to actually what happened to him. Um, why he left, uh, somebody was dead. He, some another person said that someone called me black and tan and he struck a prisoner.
But whoever put the RA or the, the civic cairns were amalgamated with the RAC and um oh, sorry, the civic cairns were amalgamated with the Dublin Metropolitan Police, so he had to leave again. Um no, then he emigrated to the United States, left a wife and three children here. And the first time, and he died, he emigrated to Canada first and ended up dying in New York. Now, where I came across him was, uh, I got a call one night when I was above in, in the guards, above in Granabar Station in Cork, by a guard who was no interest in history. He said, there's a geezer down the nursing home. He said, his father was the first guard. He told me that, and he said his name is Kerrigan. So I went down and it ended up anyway, he, the father didn't know when or where he died. So he um, he had this photograph from him, which is an Irish guard uniform. And he also, he, all he knew was that he went to New York and didn't come back. But however, he had another photograph uh, of his own sister and another gentleman in it, which he says his half brother from another family, the father uh, whose father had fathered in New York. And it turns out that eventually, anyway, both were, I got both reunited. And the grandson is actually traveling to this, um, the unveiling the plaque. I found this grave in St. Agnes Cemetery and I put a cap badge on it about 25 years ago now. And I found what he did was Patrick Joseph Kerrigan was his name. He changed his name to Joseph Patrick Kerrigan. And he's, his second wife was Austrian Jewish. She only died in 1988. Um, now, in the setting up of the Garda Shikana, the organizing committee was made up of members, uh, officers who were um, faithful to Commons during uh, the War of Independence. It was also stuck members of the IRA and the Dublin Metropolitan Police. But uh, this, the gentleman here leading in uniform and in front of all the doors here is Chief Sergeant Matthias McCarthy. He's an ex RAC man. Now, I've got a DNA match with him only in the last year. Um, he's an ex RAC man, uh, joined City Cards as a Chief Superintendent. One day he's in, uh, a sergeant in the RAC, next minute he's a Chief Superintendent of the Guards. He led the Guards into Dublin Castle. That reenactment was done in 1997 for the 75th anniversary, it's been done again in August. Um, now, another interesting thing, Michael Conan said that he would look after those members of the RAC in the service who were faithful to him during the War of Independence. So much so that in 1923, the Committee of Inquiry inquired into resigna resignations and dismissals from the Riders of Devil. And they invited ex resigned members and also uh, dismissed members to apply for a pension from the Irish government. So much so that 955 applied for pensions from the Free State. 489 were granted. 56 of those were already trans serving in the guards and they left as a result of getting this other pension. And 46 were refused, including six that were serving in the guards. And I have here two that relate to County Clare. And you see the detail that's in them. You know, people know how difficult it is to find out what stations your ancestor was only gives the county. But you can see Nicholas Nolan, um, he resigned on account of the political situation at the time in Ireland and on account of the unfair treatment of everybody connected with the movement. And you can see he was stationed in Tulla, Carrahan, Carrens Mills, Carrahan, Banner and Scarif, uh, Connolly, New Macron, Fergus, Six Mile Bridge, the County Clare. Some great detail in it for that time. And he's living in the Bronx. Um, and this is another one, a man who served in Crushing. And he gives his reason. He's now living in Brisbane. And he, he says, owing to the murder and disgraceful conduct of the Black and Tans, my patriotic sentence would not allow me to do otherwise than serve my connection from the RIC. From the time, and he gives where he's been, he only went to Australia, where he'd been living in Cork, just for his address to be verified. And the QA, hopefully. <laughs> That's fantastic. That's really, really interesting, um, Jim, the information that you've shared. And like with all your books and some of the other information that you've given us, there's there's a huge amount of um, material there to go through. 
um, for anybody that is getting into the RIC or researching RIC um, or, or some of the other police forces, their ancestry. So I'm going to go through from the top um, from the top of the chalk the chat box down. Um, and I'm going to start with some of the questions here. Are there photos on the original files for men who joined up to the 1880s in Q? And this is a question for Michael McNamara. Um, uh, well, I never seen you. No. First of all, um, there are very, I don't think there are any, well, well, we're talking about the index or what I say, the summary, the register of service. The original files do not exist, not alone. Um, all that exists is just a summary that's on, on the registers. So there's no, no photographs with any of those? No, photo no oh. photographs. Okay. Unless, unless in private hands that people have themselves that they got there. Okay. The okay. Um, that's okay. All right. That, that answers one question there. Um, Let's see now, I'll keep going down here. We have a few other questions. Um, we have a gentleman here who's joining from Galway. He has 13 plus ancestors in the RIC, including a great grandfather and a great, great grandfather. Um, is that something that it tended to, um, it, it families tended to go from generation to generation? Uh, it doesn't matter. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Um, and also, you'll find that uh, daughters and granddaughters married sons of RIC men because okay. they all mixed in the same social circle. Right. And that, okay. that's, that's really the primary. And you'll, okay. you'll, find, you'll probably find a lot of those joined at age 18. The word got around that you got a year off the age and an inch off the height. A lot of them were guaranteed that it had to happen. Even some of them, seven, they applied when they were 17 years and nine months hoping by the time they, they are squeezed through. Right. Because actually, you can see, you saw in one direct course there, but they were trying to squeeze the guy in. Uh, yeah. Just to get him in in time. Yeah, there was, there was that favoritism there. And of course, someone like that joining at the time, he would be really off to a good start because he'd have heard all the lingo down to, through the generations and with siblings and uncles and aunts and are all them talking about. And he would be very, and he would be very well, versed and had coached along then by other family members. Okay, okay, very good. Now somebody asks, if I only have an old photo of an RIC member, is there any way I can identify who he might be? And she says, or he, it's Leslie, I'm not sure if Leslie is male or female. It is a clear photo and the, um, the individual is in full uniform. No, the one thing I would ask straight away, what's the uniform is he wearing? Identify the period, number one. Okay. Um, uh, for example, the pillbox cap, it's worn, uh, the peak cap didn't come in until after uh, 1902. Okay. So at least you put in a time frame. Another thing is the various uniforms, the amount of buttons, they were actually made of black horn and the officer's buttons were black uh, metal. Um, you can also, as pockets were added, different lines of buttons and um, it's funny you should say that now because when I was doing the book on the, the black and tans um, the person who actually recruited the black and tans in London his grandson made contact with me and he told me that his he also he said I'm sitting here on in front of a portrait of my great great grandfather four generations he had the photographs of them that he's given to me but not long that in 1935, he intended writing a book on uniforms, but he's given me copies of absolutely everything back to 1836 in relation to descriptions of the buttons, the uniforms, um, the tailor's requirements, um, the spaces between the buttons is an absolute gem. And more importantly, I found them in, what would I say, more or less in treasury records for the prices to, for those to be made up going to a tailor and wow. they, they would have to what happened then was when they went to the tailor they were what they call a sealed pattern and for example if you were out in, on the, and you always had to wear the official uniform of the day and you could never be in doubt of, of it when you were in in the the depot because the latest sealed pattern were displayed in the commandant's office 
Okay. And if you broke the square and you hadn't changed your cap or your button, you were marched in before the commandant and shown exactly what you should be wearing and fined. Wow, that's something now. That's amazing. Um, that's very interesting about the uniforms and the buttons. I mean, that's that's very, very interesting. Um, Leslie has asked another or just made another comment here. Um, her grandmother, she says, or he says, I'm sorry, Leslie, if, I'm not sure if you're male or female, um, was terrified of the black and tans. She told me that she once rode a bike from West Meath to Fermanagh during the Civil War for employment and hid in the hedgerows during the day so she would not be seen by them. She only rode during the night when it was dark in order to avoid them. So they were obviously feared. Well, uh, completely, but um, there's a distinction between the types of black and tans. There's the okay. RIC Special Reserve. There are those. And in fact, uh, the R one RIC I like, did get to interview at length. He was stationed with a black and tan. And he said they were literally jealous of him because he, he, he did not learn the RAC code. He had to get all the stuff off by heart or exoparam, this type of thing. He just arrived. He had three weeks training. He sat in the back of the station. But if there was any action, he was first out. Oh, okay. but, but it mentioned that all the... And these would be in, say, there's a distinction between the ordinary RAC. He was only trained in the use of firearms. He didn't learn the code. It takes you six months training to learn the code. But there was a distinction between, say, the RAC Special Reserve, who got about a month's training for just basic training, but the temporary constables, they were the guys who that you would be afraid of because they were with the auxiliaries. And there's a huge difference between the auxiliaries then. They were completely billeted, completely separate. They had a different system of command, but their drivers essentially were, say, temporary constables driving them around. Okay. Wow. Yes. So, yeah. And, and of course, some of them, they, they give the others a bad reputation. You know, they get a bad reputation as a, a result. Um, just a comment by one of our committee members that um, in number four, there is Warburton. And I've seen that name. Warburton was in County Clare. Um, I just was going to say in relation to that, I do see in some of the um, CSORP reports that are online through the National Archives, they do list some of the names of those um, policemen or um, police, the police force that existed. I know they only, I think at the moment they only go up to 1832 or 33, but Warburton is a name that I, I have seen that has come up. Um, yeah. So in, yes, in the chief secretary's office register papers. Yes. The, the reason you'll find them any anything of say immediate importance or something that affected uh, that should be sent. There's a list of like obviously serious crimes and outrages right. that a decision would have to be made say, at government level. Um, you'll see that there, you'll find the chief secretary had had to know about it, and there was yeah. a special fast track way of getting those up. You'll get. And the minute. That's why I decided to do the index. You could pin it on a particular individual. Uh, oh. Warburton is very well known. Um, and the officer, and again, the officer class. What's also on the CSO is that years ago I came across um, several, actually, I did some bit of an index, but I didn't get around to finishing it, of applicants in 1822 when they stopped the county constabulary. Uh, the gentry, some of them wanted to become officers. And there's an awful lot of, of uh, members of the gentry uh, with, with the highest profiles and everything that, that never, never got through. Um, but, but some very interesting families, anybody doing any family research, you see they, there are more interesting fellows in the unsuccessful. I think it's about nearly over 300, I think, that wow. would have made the application kind of at the time. Hmm. And do you wonder, did they go off into the military then if they couldn't join the police force or, well, you'd have... Well, most of the early officers would have had uh, military... Oh, um, okay. Okay. Military, that was one of the really of the conditions they had been okay. from the Peninsula Wars. and But they also needed sponsors outside of that um, in, in civil life more than uh, as army officers. Okay. But again, you had to have the connections to get in at the same time. Okay. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, we have another question here. Did many of the black and tans settle in Ireland? And if they did, were they accepted into the community or were they ignored? And this gentleman says that his black and tan from Stockport served in Kilkenny, 
married the daughter of an RIC man there. And when she died, he married a relation of hers. Sorry, I'm losing this a bit. Oops, oh, yeah. I'm sorry, I just lost that. Uh, I'll go back to it there, I'm sorry. Um, that's just the cursor. Uh, so when, when she died, he married a relation of hers, another daughter of an RIC man, and he lived there until he died in 1963. So I suppose, if a black and tan settled in Ireland, were they accepted? Um, not, definitely not. No. Uh, I'd say he kept his head down. And then the very fact he married into an RIC family, the RIC family would have actually kept their head down at the same time because lots of them were, were also ostracized. Um, in fact, uh, I was told that, for example, RIC men, well, yeah, I've seen even cases where uh, RA seamen were given um, permission, so to speak, by the RA to go back to, the, to their home county, obviously they were stationed, couldn't be stationed in the home county, and okay. they'd get a letter from the local IRA, and they'd also get a pass then to leave to go down, and some of them, as a test, send some of their furniture ahead of them, and if that didn't arrive, they weren't following it. Okay, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. But if he was one of those, he definitely would have to be in the Black and Tan book of the complete list of also separated the Irish. That okay. Range. So he'd be in Black and Tan's book that you wrote. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Great. Great. Now I'm going to keep, we have a couple more questions. Here. Now we have a question. Why did some of the men choose to go into the Palestine gendarmerie? Uh, number one is they would have got a pension from the RIC. Okay. Uh, which was around 50 pounds and 14 shillings for the year. Okay. And then they had the training, they were admitted Im immediately. But it was either rather go back to England and be unemployed. And um, they, were, they were all phoned. Remember being all phoned? Uh, you didn't have to. Uh, it, was, it was really, they were, they were really um, completely kept doing the same job. And they had the same camaraderie camaraderie the same, all their, all their friends were going with them and this type of thing. But the good point afterwards for them is their RIC pension was suspended when they joined another police force. However, when they, when they left the Palestine police, they also resumed their RIC pension. So they, they ended up with two pensions. And the other thing about it is that from 19, to the 1930s onwards, the RIC pension was index linked. The RIC man that I interviewed was 74 years a pensioner, never worked again a day in his life. Wow. And um, they, 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 did, they did very well out of it afterwards. Okay, that's interesting. Um, we have another question. Was there an, well, there was really, but this, it's a very good question. Was there a legacy of antagonism towards the RIC men and families? If so, how long did it last? This gentleman says, I know of English relations visiting Cork in the 1940s who got a hard time there because their grandfather had been in the RIC in Cork. So was there a legacy of antagonism? Uh, absolutely, um, completely. And I, I tell you, when I started to collect the information first, uh, I have people whispering to me over the phone, and I was in the garage station. They, they were, they were, I, I had messages left in the station for literally notes left in for the RIC, and they considered me an RIC, and still they'd only trust me in sending on the information. Mm. And I had one man admit, uh, whispering over the phone one night, a man in his 80s, he said his daughter is out and he wants to tell the story. He said she'll be back shortly, he says like that. And he said that he remembers and gave me the name of two men involving, involved in the shooting of an RIC man. Actually, they shot uh, Tom Crean's uh, brother, Cornelius Crean. And no, he, his father was the station master in Upton. And he was a seven year old at the time. And he said, he gave me a description, gave me the two names. He said, look, uh, it was the most scariest day of my life. He said, I, I never really got over it. But he said, I have to say who did it, and he says like that. Yeah. And he, said, he just felt really at the end of it. Uh, and I'm finding that with so many policemen killed and that but the truth will win out eventually. I've had, yeah. I've solved loads of um, police murders uh, because nobody investigated, nobody was interested after us. The new state was found. There was a truth, there was all over. But the truth came in July 
there were, there were policemen killed up to October of 1922. In fact, today is the centenary. Um, and there was score and an awful lot of score settled kind of at the time. Mm, yeah. There's not too many tomatoes, nearly 50 policemen killed after the troops. After the truce. After the truce. Okay. In fact, uh, one just coming, one coming up in March. Two RI seamen in hospital in Galway uh, were shot in, in their beds in hospital, recuperating. And the shooting was so severe and went on for so long that when the doctors went into the ward, uh, they had to open the window to clear the, the smoke as a result of the shooting. That's coming up at the end of the fourteenth of March. I'm in contact with a grandson of one of them. He's now in his eighties, and. Um, Wow. Trying to find a relative of the others to put a plaque up to. Wow, that's something now. Um, now, you have a couple of very nice compliments here. Well done, Jim, from Declan Barron. Always a pleasure listening to you, which it is, very true. Um, and Gerald um, Re Re Real, great summary, Jim. Thank you. Um, thank you, Gerald, for asking some of those great questions. Leslie, excellent presentation. And I see you there, Leslie. I apologize. Um, you're not male, you're female. Um, my apologies for that. Um, Patty C., uh, Patty Casey. I think Patty, well, Patty's going off now, but he's absolutely delighted. Um, you know Patty, I think, for many years. Um, uh, Patty had had sung your praises as one of the committee members when we were saying we were going to try and get you to come and speak to us. Um, there's a couple more questions. Can you take a couple more questions, yeah, Jim? No okay. okay. Yeah. Um, Peter Malone, um, uh, and welcome, Peter. Uh, my maternal uh, great-great-grandfather, William Stewart, is recorded as being a Dublin police officer on his emigration records to Australia in 1858. What would be the best records to search online about his service? He says he has found one du Dublin newspaper record of a constable, William Stewart, A52. And he wants to know, is A52 his badge number? And I see you reaching for a book. So I'd say, Peter, you're going to get your answer. Yeah, um, there's two William Stewarts. Uh, one was born in 1816 in um, in Carrigallan, County Leitrim. Okay. And no, I tell you, um, he, and his his number was 1366. But I can also tell you, he was also under revenue police. Okay. Now, what day, what day did he immigrate again? 1850. Um, let me see if I see it here, there. 1858, his, yeah. uh, on his emigration now, records to Australia, 1858. Well, I can tell you now, he's in my revenue police book, and he's also in the Dublin Metropolitan Police okay. book. Okay, there you no, go. The other, thing, the other thing about it is, um, he was born in 1816, left in Carrigallan County Leitrim. That, that's definitely him, I'd swear on it at this stage. Okay. Now, uh, if he sends me an email, I'll send him what I have on him. Okay, uh, Peter, if you want to email me, I'll... Um, I can, yeah. I can say, yeah. I can put you in contact if that, yeah. yeah. Okay. No, no, what I've been doing with the likes of that, so that record, for example, he's just one of them. I type up the service record, both service record, and I make the link that from the, my database having the DMP, revenue police. I've already done that in the book and just listing them anyway. But what I do is I put his contact details with his permission in it. So if somebody makes contact with me in the future about it, I'll just click on his emails and on the information. That's what I've been doing all the time. Okay, now, that's great. So um, you're connecting up. That's a brilliant idea. Great. Up, uh, yeah, and then I and let him. I know that he's the research. I don't have to worry about the volume of research. He doesn't have to send me everything. Just that he's there. He's related to him. And uh, now the, the other the other thing is people don't treat the very fact that the, the DMP records are fascinating and that the difference between those and the RAC records they give this in the parish. Okay. Which is, and uh, like a person joined 1836 to 20, he's one of his 20 in 1836. So that's the civil parish of 1816. Oh, yes. Do not even exist. So it's. Yeah. It's, and he's still the same person in both organizations. And and 1858 is 100% because they were disbanded on the 1st of October, 1857. And by the time he got himself together, not a few months when he's gone. Okay. 
Okay, that's great. And Jim, just as out of curiosity, I'm just going to make a comment. Do you think that nearly every family in Ireland has some RIC connection, whether they want to admit it or not? Well, I put I I put it to you this way. Everybody had to have two parents. There was eighty five thousand in the RIC. That's a quarter of a million people with descendants. Mm. Now I make out between the other police forces, including the Dublin Metropolitan Police and those. The 200,000 policemen have gone through the system up to 1922. So you can do your multiples from there. And they didn't have small families. No. It is frightening the, the numbers that I'm getting in at this stage. Um, who's connected to who? I've actually found a connection to uh, um, Bram Stoker. Oh, wow. Bram Stoker's uh, maternal grandfather was Thomas Thornley, killed on duty. Wow. Uh, I found one to Napoleon Bonaparte, the Bonaparte Wise family above Wexford. Um, there was a, an officer in that family, uh, Patrick Wise, he was drowned above in Galway, and he married into Bonaparte Wise, that's for that connection. Okay. There's hardly a family in the country, I said, it's some, like there was 834 Murphys in the RIC. <laughs> Yeah. Just only just take it just uh, just only just take it on that loan, so you can. And there's no shortage of Murphys out there. But again, they have a unique sequential uh, number that puts them in a time frame. Mm. Like for example, I took before. It's only when I finished the red book when I had a complete index that I knew that everything that I would get in would be a hit. If it was RIC, it had to be one of them. And the beauty about it, for example. Uh, say the numbers were up to 30,000, say in 1870. Mm. person tells me uh, my grandfather uh, joined about 1850. I don't have to even think of anybody after that date. And I can find exactly, just, it, I'm in a small window frame within at that stage, but here's the information and I put it in. And then uh, another way of people, usually people starting the family tree want to go straight back, the great great grandpa straight back. They never think about going out. Mm, yeah. But when they do go out and they find out RFC and someone in records, mm. um, the, the line extends again and you'll find them again with the same pattern. The word got out about this was a pensionable job. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I found with the revenue police, they, uh, they, it was so difficult for them, but they gathered up the money. They worked hard for about two years, kept their head down. And it was one way of getting cash straight away at Democrat. Yeah. And in the late 1850s, and I'm in contact with countless different police forces. I got, as I've been going through the records, say, um, the Royal Canadian Motor Police, the curator there, Victoria Police in Australia, uh, they match records with me. And I've done the same with the Palestine Police or Comrades Association. One meeting with them. Frozen there. Hopefully, you'll come back every time. Good. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the posse that was led to just yes, Ned Kelly, a couple of DMP men, and relations of DMP men. In fact, one fella that he shot uh, was the son of a DMP man, and the great grandson also joins here in Ireland. and two families that were involved in the posse, both their relatives are now serving the Victoria police, and they met up one particular day as a result of it, so. Wow, yeah, it's, it's amazing. It's never ending. Never ending is right. When, do you, when is your most recent book gonna be out? Just um, The next one, I'm, the one I'm doing on the Irish, uh, well, Irish Conservative Auxiliary Force. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, what I did, my intention was to find all of the huts, I, I found all of those. I found all the protection posts. Okay. What happened was, say, just briefly, in a particular area, if there was, um, say, a landlord intimidated and it went on, no one was going to go on, then um, they decided then at headquarters, we have to put protection there. We can't leave all the ordinary receiver. This hut is requisition, and the hut is, comes down by train. There's all types of intimidation on the way about they're not allowed to unload it, the strikes, there's all this type of thing. Eventually it gets landed out in this particular place mm. and it's out there. And the, the records are similar to the RIC records where they're deployed in this type of thing. But there's 440 of them recruited from Ireland, England, Wales and Scotland, mostly ex-soldiers because straight away they're only here a week and they're off. Um, 
they were up uh, campaigning. But uh, when they were being recruited at the time, uh, they didn't want XRA Seaman to join. And what they put in was, it's not going to do anything for your pension. So not too much, I don't think, I've yet to find one that did uh, join um, at the time. But uh, probably in the, in the next six months, I, as I said, the lockdown was great because I'd intended just putting in the basic information. I ended up typing up to 440 service records during the lockdown. So. Okay. Just as easy to there, there was a temporary RIC hut just down the road, so I'm, I'm going to be very interested to see your book now. I, I'd be looking forward to that when that comes yeah. out, um, because I know with um, the land well, rates. Is, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Well, you can actually link it. If you leave for it, they were only allocated to certain counties, so you can literally map land war. Anybody doing any research in the world will have an absolute feel there, because um, above, I know in County Mayo. Um, what's the chap above there in the museum or in the, the centre? I made contact with him with one hour conversation one night. And for every hut that I named, he named the landlord. And he knew yeah. the event and what happened, why, why yeah. it was there and how long it lasted. But what the RIC did was in their RIC list, they published the list of first because it comes like a temporary, it eventually becomes a temporary station. When, when even when they move out, it becomes a permanent station. That's why and north of the stations are in the most obscure places. Mm. Um, yeah. Because it came in as a temporary uh, hut mm. and then the problem persisted and then eventually, and there's um, a couple of attempts to try and burn them out and this type of thing. That's but right. You can yeah. see the inside, there, there was metal on the inside and there are these holes to fire shots out of there. There are all these the hammocks inside of it. And mm. there's even a description on the upkeep of the hut. Okay. Uh, the landlord scored because he was actually paid. Uh, they had to pay rent to him to put the hut on this, even though he was being protected. Okay. Um, and then uh, the manning of the hut, the, the cost of it, um, a phenomenal cost, like kind of uh, for, for that short period, but they, they literally wiped out the problem. You could see at uh, the scale of, of the amount of um, things that were happening at the start from eight, nearly one to eight, nearly three. They, they, they think I rid of themselves did such a good job. Mm. Wow, that's great. Well, listen, Jim, thank you so much for your um, for your talk tonight. I mean, there's so much to absorb with the the information that you have gathered and um, the information that you that you have from all your years and years of research. So many, many thanks for that. Um, I will pass on some of the emails that I had talked to you about earlier. Um, for people that couldn't be here. I just want to very quickly before we sign off to let our members know that we have two more talks scheduled for this season. The next talk is not a Thursday night because the Thursday night is St. Patrick's Day night and hopefully you'll have your masks off and you'll all be out. But that, um, so we will be having our, our March talk on the Wednesday night, the 16th of March. Um, and that talk will be by a, um, she's a native of Clare Castle, living in Sydney. And her name is Kathy Rowan. And she is going to be talking about the revision books or the canceled books of Griffith's Valuation. Um, her talk is entitled, Who's Been Living in My House? Clare Castle, 1855 to 1970. So that'll be very interesting. The revision books are fascinating. So that'll be a very interesting talk. And our last talk, which will be on, we'll be back to our Thursdays, um, the 21st of April. This is just advance notice. Mary Alice Wildeson, who has recently completed a master's in the history of the family, will be speaking about famine migration to Quebec. Um, so the 16th of March, a Wednesday night at eight o'clock is our next talk. And then after that in April, we're back to our third Thursday, the 21st of April. And my sincere apologies to anybody about the mix up in the Zoom link. I think that's my fault. Um, so I'll try and, and uh, resolve that issue before the 16th of March. Um, just in future, if that if we ever discovered, because we did discover that at kind of 10 to eight this evening, um, uh, I will put something up on the Facebook 
page if anybody's on Facebook for Claire Roots. I suppose I should put it up as well for the um, the Twitter account. I'll do that the next time. Hopefully there won't be a next time. And Larry um, Parks, our secretary, sent out a, a very quick email and Aileen uh, adjusted the the ID or the meeting code number. So um, very, um, very much sincere apologies for that. But thank you for persevering and um, listening to it. It was well worth list coming and listening to the talk there. So uh, a very good night to everybody. And we look forward to seeing you on Wednesday, the 16th of March at 8 p.m. And that those two meetings are Zoom meetings, um, unless otherwise. Uh, but for the moment, they're Zoom meetings. Okay. So everybody have a great okay. night. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye now.